My name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we're pleased to welcome June Boyd. June has been in Toledo for more than 50 years, of which she spent most of her adult life as a politician. Mrs. Boyd, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, Mrs. Boyd, I'd like to talk to you um, about your life here in Toledo. Okay. Um, tell me, when did you arrive to Toledo? Okay. I came to Toledo in April of 1937 as a two-year-old with my mother. And uh, our first uh, stop, we uh, moved in with my aunt in the Brand Whitlock Homes. And the number of that project was 251. And of course, those were delightful projects in those days. Because they were almost new at that time. Yes, rather they than were. Not. OK, mm -hmm. good. Um, and so what was your mother's sister's name? My sister, her sister's name was Mamie. And she had another sister that was, her name was Ella, but they had all left from the South and migrated to Toledo. Okay. Do you have a sense of why they chose Toledo? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I know my aunt found a husband. I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> the thing that attracted them all here, but uh, it's an interesting question because the majority of our family members from the Richardson clan ended up in Toledo. So maybe because it's a great city. Yeah, that could be mm -hmm. it. That could be it. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Um, what schools did you attend as you were growing up in Toledo? Well, as a youngster, uh, prior to converting to Catholicism, mm -hmm. I attended uh, Washington, Roosevelt, and uh, there's so much delight because, you know, you remember I'm a product of the good old days. Sure. And uh, as a seven-year-old, I converted to Catholicism, and then I um, went to St. Francis de Sales Elementary. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the interesting part there, uh, we were discriminated against as uh, African-American children from one school that was St. Patrick's, but it did not deter us. The education at St. Francis was wonderful. We had Franciscan sisters, and it uh, propelled me as an eighth grader to get into St. Ursula Academy, okay. uh, ending up as the first African-American to graduate from there. Talk a little bit about how that, pro about how that the happened. Process. Yeah. Well, uh, in most instances, when a, a student gets to the eighth grade, the high schools open up open house to them. And um, our class went to St. Ursula Academy, and I was so impressed with the education process. I went home and I told my mom that I wanted to attend St. Ursula Academy. And she said, well, they probably don't take colored because we had been <laughs> already uh, slammed as a result of the uh, elementary school. But my mother had the courage to call. And she called and asked Sister Mary Blanche if um, they took colored. And Sister said, and why not? <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. Okay. You know, there were about four of us that enrolled, but by the end of my senior year, three of those had dropped out, and that I ended up being the first. But I think there were two instances that, that I remember most is that in my junior year, I served on the class newspaper, and the sisters sent those of us who were on the staff to Notre Dame University for a one-week class in journalism. Mm -hmm. Very educational. I'm probably one of the best proofers and writers you can find. <laughs> but uh, in my senior year, our senior class trip in Washington, I personally was afraid to go because the, it was prior to the Civil Rights Movement. And that would have been like 1953. 53. And mm -hmm. you chose not to go because I chose of... not to go. I probably could have, but within myself, you remember what happened to Emmett Till and, and all those That's things. Right. That That's kind right. of stays in your the mind that you just, I, as a child, I just didn't want to you know, run into run anything into negative, so I just stayed home. No, what was your experience like at St. Ursula Academy? Excellent. 
uh, obviously, St. Earth's Academy, so a good percentage of the students were ver from very wealthy families. Okay. Doctors, uh, the Andersons and Mommy, uh, one of those girls were my classmate. And you find that children from that type heritage are less prejudiced. I, had, I ran into no uh, prejudice at all the entire four years that I was there. I was just treated like one of them. Okay. And the other key element, and I think this is why so many schools have come to uniforms now. Um, we used to have to wear uniforms with collars and cuffs, and they used to be that hard celluloid, just like the nuns, but they did change it. But the sisters always taught us the reason they uh, express that they wanted you to wear uniforms because the wealthy girls look like the girls that maybe weren't so wealthy. Everyone was dressed okay, the same. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so it, it made sense then. Yes. No, I'm just wondering also, I know that at least during that time period, um, most African Americans tended to fall in some of the more traditional religions, Baptist, yes. Methodist, Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. How many Catholic, black Catholics do you recall at that time? Well, we had a few uh, obviously, it's, it's a much smaller number, and ironically, my mother had me baptized at five years old as a Baptist, and uh, the minister, it frightened me so. That, uh, he covered me with this little white cap and gown, and he slung me in the water, and I didn't sure. like it. So I had some friends that went to a Catholic church, and um, I went started going to church with them, so I converted on my own to Catholicism. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, good, good. And there, there are still a good number of Black Catholics like, in Toledo now. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But I just know traditionally, no, you know, that's not mm -hmm. one of the, the, the religions, dominations that we have gravitated mm -hmm. towards. And so, well, good. Um, let's talk about life then as you're growing up here in Toledo. Yes. What, first of all, who were some of your childhood friends mm -hmm. and what kinds of things that you do socially? Mm -hmm. as you're growing well, up? my classmates uh, especially were first, and ironically, Two of those girls, we go to the same parish today, really? and uh, we share our families and everything, every church on Sunday. But uh, my family home, because we were one of the first families that moved out of the Brand Whitlock home, because in those days my father was making too much money, he was a mechanic. Really? And um, I, we lived right across from one of the most popular parks in the city, called City Park. Okay. So I had a lot of friends. We played baseball, we had swimming, uh, lots of fun activities, and it was so different from the way it is today because uh, you could send your child out to the park to play and not fear that they wouldn't be coming home. Sure, So it sure. was really different. We, and then we didn't have television. Uh, I was 13 when one of my friends, they got the first television, <laughs> and uh, the joke of that, uh, they lived on Woodland Avenue, and there would be about 50 of us kids on the front porch looking at, through the window Is of the television. Right? <laughs> yes, so, and, and we were happy. You know, we listened to the radio, uh, Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, and The Shadow Knows, and I couldn't remember a more happier time. Wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, you were telling me earlier that you would provide snacks for your friends. Yes. What kind of snacks did you prepare? We used to eat mayonnaise and sugar sandwiches. I would invite kids over from the park, and we'd make tents in the yard. And today, I probably couldn't stand it. <laughs> but we enjoyed that those sandwiches. I mean, it was just kids camping out. So it sounds as if it was a good, wholesome mm -hmm. childhood. Yes, it was. Okay. I, I had wonderful parents, and uh, and I think a lot of the children did. Uh, you don't hear, we didn't hear of any abuse or anything. And, of course, we didn't have a drug problem then either. Sure, So, sure. you know, life was much different at, in those days. Certainly. And I continue to call it the good old the days. The good old and days. And happiness and sure. love. Sure. Mm -hmm. What did you do after high school? Well, I um, went to the university. I enrolled at the University of Toledo. And I probably spent about six months there. Then I fell in love. Okay. And uh, I decided to get married. Okay. And uh, right after my marriage, uh, my f who's now my former husband, was drafted into the Army. And not too long after that, he was shipped off to Germany because okay. of the Hungarian Revolt. Okay. So um, we had just had a young, my, young, my firstborn, um, a daughter. And by the time she was six months old, I joined him in Germany, Did in you? Nuremberg. Okay. And of course, that's a lifetime wonderful experience. And um, 
I sometimes I always say I'd like to go back, sure. but it's a little more difficult to travel now with the terrorist activity. Oh, absolutely, you know, I, absolutely, kind of frightening. When, when I left Germany, I always told the people that I met there I look forward to coming back. Um, you know, I was able to speak some German and had a great time over there on the army bases and we lived among some of the German families because, you know, they didn't have very much money over there. They did not have uh, access to coffee and Tide and the products that we have. And consequently, we would exchange them for fine china, really? for wool and knits and everything. So um, just great memories. And the other key thing, they did not have much refrigeration. So they only slaughtered the meat that they could sell in a day. So you talk about fresh meat. Really? It doesn't even look anything like the meat here in the grocery stores. Well, I know that must have been a time of heightened racial tensions in the U.S. Mm -hmm. between blacks and whites in particular. Yes, somewhat. How did the Germans treat African Very Americans? Very good. Well, because I obviously traveled alone. Uh, when I arrived in Nuremberg, um, this German couple came up because obviously I was trying to find out how to get the train mm -hmm. to uh, Bremerhaven. They came right up and asked, did they want me to hold the baby? Well, the, the wife took me to find the ticket really? service and everything. And I didn't have any fear whatsoever. Really? You know, I was young, and okay. um, but they were very kind to me. Really had, interesting. Did not have any problem whatsoever. Okay, okay. So then to that Union, you had one child. Yes. That was no, a, I have two. I have a son. Okay. And their names? Mm -hmm. Stephen okay. is my son, and Charlotte is my daughter, okay. and, and they're both wonderful children. Okay. And they're the oldest then, is they're, that correct? Charlotte is the oldest. Okay. And he's the youngest. He's and the youngest. Then each of them, they have, he has three children, and she has one, which makes me have four grandchildren. Four grandchildren. And now four wonderful great-grandchildren. Great-grandchildren. Yeah, we have a great family. Well, it sounds like it. I'm not mm -hmm. sure you do. Um, so then, w at what point did you return from Toledo, back to Toledo, rather? From Germany. Uh, it was the latter part of 1957, and at that time, my mother, this is how she instilled this education, she said, you know, you dropped out of college, you've got to get back in school and get that education. So I went to uh, Stoltenberger Business College and okay. took an executive business course, and uh, I Finney, I was like a month short of graduating because I'd gotten pregnant again with my little boy. Mm -hmm. But uh, right after I finished that job, um, I had started doing some volunteer work politically. Okay. And um, the people that got me in as a volunteer, I was hired as the first African American to work at the Board of County Commissioner's Office. And really? okay. it was kind of a prestigious job. And, um, you know, it's kind of neat when you're kind of paving the way for others, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I was the first, but uh, it was a nice job. Okay. And it enabled me to learn more about county government because the county commissioner's office basically is the entire function of county government. Every other office kind of okay. succeeds from there. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about your, your political career in mm -hmm. just a bit, but let me go, go back and talk about two things, um, race relations and Door Street. Okay. Um, let's do race relations first. All right. Um, during the time in which you were coming of age in, in mm -hmm. Toledo, how would you characterize race relations? Well, as a youngster, the only discrimination that I encountered was when we weren't allowed to go to that one Catholic school. Okay. Uh, not even in the public school system did we have any, but it was ob obviously predominantly African American community. Sure, it would sure. have been colored in those <laughs> days. <laughs> right, right. But um, we had, when you talk about Door Street, uh, the person that we're honoring, Edreen Cole, grew up on Door Street. But we also had a lot of businesses that were black owned, mm -hmm. uh, from cleaners to restaurants to s gas stations. And uh, I think our community was like just one big community where everybody knew everybody. You sure. know, we didn't have to worry about crime. You could just go to sleep at night with your door open. And, and it was just basically a friendly environment. Well, those are the good old days, mm -hmm. as, yes, as you talked about. Yes. So then, do you, you recall any? restaurants or theaters in which you received differential treatment? No, we were allowed to go. Uh, there were theaters downtown. We'd go, there was a Pantheon, the Paramount, and the 
the Rivoli, we were never discriminated against. We did not have black here and white here. Uh, when people say, well, most of it was in the South, they may have been subjected to that black and white issue rather than the kids in the North, because we never had to be subjected to that. Okay. Now, I can't speak for other cities, but not in Toledo. Okay, okay. Because others have, have told me that uh, in some of the theaters uh, in, in Toledo, um, African Americans had to sit upstairs and the whites sat downstairs. Uh -huh. Well, maybe I was so little, <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> now, that, you know, that could have been, but uh, I would not have known the difference as a youngster. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and that could be because when we did go to the movies, we went in groups of threes, fours, okay, and okay. rarely with adults. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, sure, sure. Okay, let's, let's go back. Um, I said in the opening that you had spent a great deal of your adult life yes. um, as a politician. Mm -hmm. How did you first get into politics? Well, uh, that was when I began to volunteer in uh, 1958. And uh, following that time, that's when the, the, the couple, they kind of just grafted, drafted me and said uh, this county commissioner was looking for an African American because, you know, the offices were lily white and most of downtown Toledo. Mm -hmm. uh, there were just a few black women that had jobs. I, I don't even think the banks had integrated at that time. I started working in the commissioner's office in 1959, okay. and that was probably the year at the beginning where, because, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, they, they've got some African Americans there and some in the city. Uh, a select few, and then gradually they started integrating in the, the banks. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, discrimination because, I mean, let's face it, in the 40s, the only jobs offered to African Americans were butlers, maids, cleaning people. Mm -hmm. So we did begin to grow in the late 50s and into the early 60s. Okay, so then th th there mm -hmm. was some oh, discrimination yes. in, oh, in definitely. Toledo then, especially mm -hmm. in areas of employment. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. How about residentially? Were people sort of confined to particular Same parts areas. of the city? Yes, and, and I'm glad you said that because uh, when, when the majority of us lived in the Brand Whitlock homes, uh, there were African Americans that lived in East Toledo, and in a, like the Yondota neighborhood, and um, for, but the majority that I knew, and, and prominent families like our former vice mayor J. B. Simmons was was our neighbor, Stanley Cow, who had a successful restaurant business. Uh, we all lived kind of like in a circle in the Brand Whitlock homes. But what happened with my father earning the money that he was as a mechanic, mm -hmm. and he was a very hardworking individual he began, he was earning too much and we had to move. Okay. And we were one of the first families that moved, but we did not move far. We moved on City Park, okay. which was about maybe two long blocks from the Brand Whitlock homes and directly across from the park. Sure, sure. We moved right next door to a prominent black physician, Dr. Hart, Dr. and Mrs. Hart. Okay. But the balance of our neighbors were German. It was called old uh, German town like. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as they began to spread out, uh, if you go down Woodland Avenue, if you've heard of Woodland in yes, Toledo, yes, yes. the 900 block of Woodland, the majority of the families that live moved from the Brand Whitlock homes moved into the 900 block of Woodland. It was a long time uh, before they began to branch out. And we did, and being in the real estate business, I'm very familiar and have been subjected to um, discrimination until we got the civil rights laws in real estate. Uh, but it, it's, it's un, uh, amazing, just to tell you one story that I had to show you what was taking place. I had a real estate prospect that was moving from Door Street, it was called Urban Renewal. Removal. She was being relocated because of Urban Renewal. Okay. And immaculate housekeeper, just home was beautiful and she wanted to see this home on Shenandoah. So I called and it's, if they can't stereotype your voice, you know, I said, this is June Boyd with Shriner Realty. Could you tell me about this home? I remember the address, 1936 Shenandoah. So the agent on the other line said, well, if your prospects are black, it's 33,000. And if they're white, it's 22,000. Really? Yes, and so I said, oh really? I said, well, I'm black. And he almost ate the telephone <laughs> because he did not you know, recognize my voice as being black. Now about, now, about what year is this? That was exactly 1968. Wow. 
1968. Really? And you know what? I reported him to the Board of Community Relations, and by the time we went through all the process, he was offering her that home for 19000 But you know what? The home she was moving from was more beautiful because it was just two little old retired ladies. It was not that clean. Sure, sure. And, uh, but it just goes, and I've had two or three other incidents like that. That's why we had to get the civil rights laws in real estate. Mm -hmm. And we have to take continuing education every three years mm -hmm. because now if anyone made a statement like that or tried to steer anyone sure. into a different neighborhood, they would lose their license. Now, at the time in which you became a realtor, how many other realtors were there in Toledo? There, I would say African American, probably six, six maybe, no more than 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But we did have uh, Robert Jones Real Estate Company. He was a, a community icon. He had his own real estate company. In fact, my former husband worked for him. But I went to the white company, Shriner, when I got my license. Okay. But uh, great experiences, and you'd have to see it to believe it. You know, you know it just goes to show you that um, people of color are needed in all kinds of professions. Yes. Um, otherwise, yes. had you not been there mm -hmm. uh, to intercede in that case at That's least, right. um, this person would have been either forced to pay a higher price oh, or not yes. move there at all. But it has happened even so. Before they got the civil rights movement, uh, just to give you a quick example, um, I had another prospect that wanted to live on Whitegate off of Burn Road. And so I called, and here again, you know, never stereotype a voice. I said, uh, this is June Boy of the Shrine of Realty. I'm inquiring about your home on Whitegate. And he said, well, it's 35000 And I said, well, is that a firm asking price? And he said, well, you know, there's a lot of colors that want to move in here. <laughs> so 35000 was okay. But same thing. I said, oh, really? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm black. And it, it's just so interesting to have heard the, the other end of the telephone. Now, we, we talked about sort of the segregation that was sort of caused by whites in Toledo. Yes. Let's say. Do you recall, I'm going to flip this a little bit, was there ever a time you think that African Americans themselves were self-segregated in the sense that um, were we stratified amongst each other mm -hmm. in, in that? Probably felt more comfortable but there are a lot of prominent families who, I, I, as an example, we had a prominent physician and his wife. They were making an effort to move out of the central city again before the civil rights laws and real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, a white realtor was taking her out, and she drove her about three blocks, and she said, are you African American? It was probably black at that time, and she said, yes, yeah. she took her back home. Did she really? Yeah, she took her back home. That couple ended up having a proxy, a white couple, bought the home that they moved into. So, you know, there were some struggles. But today, if you've got the money, obviously, because of the laws and they've changed, you can live any place you'd want. So then it wasn't necessarily about class. Because, you could, mm -hmm. in other words, you could have had the money to afford mm -hmm. to live in a better neighborhood, mm -hmm. but you weren't allowed to. No. Because there were barriers there. That's right, definitely. And there was also what they call block busting. Uh, we had a, uh, there was, if there was a corrupt realtor, uh, they would go through a neighborhood and say, uh, would you like to put your house up for sale? There's African Americans moving in. And a lot of those people would be encouraged to put their homes up for sale. It was called block busting. Really? And that was classed as illegal too. Were there, were there any neighborhoods where there were restrictive covenants in, in place, as far as you know? Mm, you mean as far as establishing laws? What were agreements um, between neighbors which says that we'll only sell to, or this, these, these homes can uh -huh. only be purchased by white people or? No, there were no covenants, but it was probably a secret covenant. Okay. You know, it was a, probably a secret covenant, but it did get pretty bad. I mean, and you know what changes it are lawsuits. Sure. And uh, after the civil rights uh, movement, I mean, there were realtors, the brokers that lost their license really? because they were caught discriminating. And so right now, even if it's in their heart, it better not be in their pocketbook because they would lose their license. Lose their license. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's switch gears a little bit. 
And then this may be related to your involvement in politics. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you were among the first African American female um, city council persons. Yes. Mm -hmm. What prompted that? Well, uh, and uh, there was an issue. Uh, when we switched to the strong mayor for, form of government, we used to have the city manager form of government, mm -hmm. and um, they kept saying, well, maybe we need the strong mayor form of government. So when we did that, uh, instead of nine council members, they decided to go six at large and six districts. Okay. And the establishment of the districts would allow more African Americans. Okay. And that's when that came about in 1993. And uh, in fact, we had, um, Edna Brown and I were the first two. She was from District 4, which is right where we are now. Mm -hmm. And uh, mine was District 1, which was a little bit further out, closer to Secor Road. And uh, we were both successful, but that was the key. And District 4 was the prime location that they could guarantee an African American would get elected. Okay. What challenges did you face um, both running for council and then once you got on council, as an African-American mm -hmm. woman? Yes. Well, not really. Uh, the, one, the hard work. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of work. And sometimes a thankless job. I mean, you know, you'd go to the gas station, they, Mrs. Boyd, uh, you know, something's wrong in my street, you know, no matter where you went. But I've always been a community activist and a servant, so it was kind of well and easy for me because I enjoy working for others and, and being sincere, you know, about getting the job done. And I think my constituents always took a lot of pride. I'd say, you can call me at 2 in the morning. And really? sometimes I did get calls at 2 in the morning about, you know, kids uh, loitering and fighting and making noise and everything. But uh, it was a bit of satisfaction for me, mm. and, and I enjoyed it. Thinking back, what are some of one or two of your proudest accomplishments as a city councilwoman? Uh, probably um, establishing uh, neighborhoods like we had, uh, like Sleepy Hollow, as an example. Mm -hmm they had park boards and people didn't know that they could take ownership of a park. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped them establish the Sleepy Hollow Park Board and also in the Roosevelt District because um, it gives gives them a more of a sense of pride and ownership and uh, you know they made it beautiful at Christmas time they put lights on the trees and the other thing uh, when I served it was right around the time when gang activity was um, you know, just beginning to get, it was a little violent, sure. and we lost several young people. And uh, when we did, I would always try to pay a visit either to the funeral home, uh, go to the wake, talk to the parents, really? and ask them if there's anything I could do to help or <clears throat> maybe whatever, what could we do to prevent future uh, actions like that. And I think the whole accomplishment was basically working with people and the satisfaction that they were satisfied with uh, everything that I had done. Certainly, certainly. Mm -hmm. Well, good, Mrs. Boyd, it sounds as if you had just a wonderful life here yes. in Toledo. Mm -hmm. um, you've given much of yourself. Yes. And you know, and, and I think that the city is better because of people like you mm -hmm. um, who gave selfishly, who gave of themselves mm -hmm. um, without any expectation of something in return. Yes, yes. There, there's one other thing that I want to point out. Um, <clears throat> one of our um, great, great women that we had, uh, her name was Frances Belcher, uh, a.k.a. Lady B. Uh, she had the first black newspaper in Toledo called the Bronze Raven. Sure, sure. And she established the debutante cotillion, and I was one of the first debutantes in 1952. And um, after I became, you know, a debutante, and I worked with her, as my mother did, to present future debutantes. And when she passed away, I asked her husband if he would want to continue, and he said no. And we had just organized, I'm a founding member of the Negro Business and Professional Women's Club, mm -hmm. so I took the cotillion to them. Okay. And we continued and established that. And that is it's a major accomplishment, I feel, because we were presenting young women in what we call into society. Certainly. And Lady B established it because she had gone to New York and seen a cotillion, and she came back to Toledo and said, you know, 
uh, we can present our girls into society. They don't have to be from the Rockefeller family. Sure, they sure. could be from the Jones family, and and that's one thing we did. And and they're still active. I'm no longer with the organization, but they're still but they're still active presenting the cotillion. Wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. I okay, think just another example of yes. how you've given yourself. Mm -hmm. um, to the, to the community. Well, I think it's important, and I think if you can serve as a role model, just like our President Obama, he is encouraging people constantly to put yourself forward and volunteer. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I can imagine that you must serve as a role model for a lot of young ladies these mm -hmm. days, and, and men as well. I try. You know, mm -hmm. What words of encouragement could you offer to them in terms of pursuing their dreams? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, never let anyone break your spirit. Never let anyone, uh, if you have a dream, let them know that you can succeed. And it doesn't matter, there may be a lot of obstacles, but you can overcome those obstacles, sometimes making you stronger. Get a good education. That will lead to a good job and a great future. Great. Well, Mrs. Boyd, as we wrap up here, is there anything else that we need to talk about that we have not? I, you know, just I think what's so important um, as we're, I'm understanding we're giving, I'd like to give a personal tribute to Edrine Cole. Certainly. And what she represented, uh, especially in the field of education. Certainly. She was so dedicated and so proper and all the children that um, had, were fortunate enough to have her as a teacher are probably some of our finest citizens today because I remember whether it's working side by side with her or just watching her. Um, she had done a wonderful job and I, I wish myself and all the other women would carry her legacy as long as we live to continue to do that and be an example. Wonderful. Well then we'll let that be the very last word mm -hmm. and once again thank you ever so much thank for taking you. time out of it your schedule. It has been a pleasure. Well, thank you very okay, much. Thank you.